yesterday upon the stair. I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. This is the opening stanza to the 1899 poem Antigonesh by William Hughes Mearns. It's not an especially meaningful poem, there's no real backstory to it. One could say it's simply a ghost story inspired by Mern's own experiences, or perhaps if you're inclined to read into it, you could see it as an eerie metaphor that captures that feeling we all have that something just isn't right about our surroundings, but we don't exactly know what. I suppose that's the best way to describe any mystery thriller, yet identity latches onto it like a monkey around a banana, and its poignant use within the film gives it a strong sense of purpose that I want you to keep this stanza in mind as I describe the film. The story follows ten strangers who arrive at a suspiciously empty Nevada motel at the dead of night only to be preyed upon by a vicious serial killer, all while they deduce that each of them might be connected in some way or another. If that setup sounds familiar, that's because Identity is a generously light deviation of Agatha Christie's most iconic and best-selling novel And Then There Were None, the story of several strangers invited to an island where they discover they have no personal knowledge of the host and are gradually killed off one by one. That's the basic outline for the story, but trust me when I say there is a major plot point I am withholding just for now that will either leave you jaw dropped or scratching your head in sheer bewilderment. While I must admit, Identity is one of my favourite psychological mystery thrillers, there's no getting past the fact that it has one of the most ridiculously far-fetched concepts to wrap your head around, which I'll reveal at the end of the video. While putting your faith in a screenwriter responsible for those bizarre Jack Frost horror movies says it all, it's director James Mangold's ability to elevate the story into a borderline horror movie that gives it a sinister modern tone. What Identity does so brilliantly is maintain a powerful feeling of discomfort and dread as you grow immensely suspicious of each stranger who might not be who they say they are. The thing is, it's easy to become desensitised to the killings in any traditional murder mystery, because the story is usually treated in such a cerebral way that your attention is focused on solving the mystery, rather than experiencing the emotional impact of the events that transpire. However, identity is all about manifesting a surreal and uncanny atmosphere. Calling back to Mern's poem, there's something not quite right about the motel setting, but it's difficult to grasp what's so off-putting about it. Personally, I think it might have something to do with how Mangold chooses to disassociate you from its setting. In other words, it takes a conventional desert location we typically know as hot, bright, dry and spacious, and turns it into a pitch black foreboding wilderness and drowns it in this unknowing darkness that isolates the motel from the outside world. In fact, identity leans very heavily on superstition without making things feel implausible. For example, one scene sees a killer convict trying to escape the motel as his correctional officer tries to track him down, only to somehow find himself looping back to the motel. It's entirely possible he just got lost in the desert and went in circles, but because everything up to this point feels so unnatural, it's like they're all trapped in a state of purgatory. It's like they're there for a reason. It's clearly trying to push you towards seeing things as supernatural, as the film's most emotionally fragile character starts spurting out theories about aliens, ghosts and ancient burial grounds after reading a bunch of the motel's tourist brochures that call attention to Nevada's history of superstition. And all of this takes place under the powerful, godly omnipresence of a storm that's judging them as if they're all paying for their sins. However, what truly elevates the tension is just how seemingly uncharacteristic everyone is. What I mean is, there's a detached, almost apathetic, even unempathetic quality to most of their behaviour to the point there's something unreal and artificial about them. Thank you so much for your assistance. It's a good idea. 
Of course, as we're about to see, there's a very clear reason for this, but regardless, the only character without any subtlety is the film trying to have me believe that Ray Liotta was a good guy playing a correctional officer, because I was immediately onto him like a fly on shit, so it was no surprise to discover that he was actually an escaped convict posing as an officer and in cahoots with the other convict. Yet, that's not even the film's most unusual twist. Before this reveal, the motel manager Larry explains that he actually arrived at the motel much earlier than the other characters to find the original manager dead, and after putting his body in the icebox until he was able to get in touch with the police due to a lack of phone signal, he inadvertently and unconsciously started behaving like the motel manager to various guests, and just got comfortable until it became natural to him. Sure, I agree, it's incredibly ridiculous, but it serves two purposes to the story. With one of them having a bit of truth to it, as one character states, the story sounds so unbelievable that it might be true. For as absurd as the film's events are, it's not exactly uncommon for bizarre things like this to happen in real life. But the other point, on the other hand, requires us to get to the grand reveal, so hold on to your arse cheeks. So the major plot point I withheld from the beginning is actually not a secret as it appears intermittently throughout the story, but because it's delivered in such a contrived and ambiguous fashion, it gives away more than it probably should. What we do know for certain from the beginning of the film is that a man called Malcolm Rivers is 24 hours away from being executed after committing a series of murders in an apartment complex some time ago, and his attorney and psychiatrist are trying to plead insanity in order to revoke his death sentence after they discover misfiled journals that shine new light on the case. Supposedly during this, the strangers arrive at the motel where a series of new murders take place, prompting several theories like Malcolm escaping, having an accomplice, a copycat killer, maybe what we're seeing are events that happened in the past that led to Malcolm's conviction, or perhaps Malcolm was wrongfully convicted of the killings. Ultimately, the only real reason the story presents this information so early is to not only maintain a certain level of misdirection, but so it doesn't appear out of the blue during the final act of the story. Eventually we learn that all the characters have one thing in common, they all share the same birthday, which also happens to be the same birthday as Malcolm Rivers and the same day he committed the murders he's on death row for. It's also casually noted that all the characters are named after places in America like Ed Dakota, Samuel Rhodes, Larry Washington, Lou, Easyana, I swear to god I wish I was making that up, but the most unusual event that happens is when the bodies of victims begin disappearing as if they never existed, prompting acceptance to the idea that yeah, maybe this whole thing was some sort of supernatural alien conspiracy. Or worse, maybe it was all just a dream. During the attorney meeting, we discover that Malcolm Rivers has disassociative personality disorder, as the misfiled journals reveal several different entries from characters all connected to Rivers. His psychiatrist Dr. Malik explains that because Rivers has no recollection of the events, one of his other personalities is in fact the real killer, and so by channeling all the personalities together and isolating one of them to track down the killer personality to destroy it, it will allow Rivers to declare insanity instead of being executed the very next day. Look, I don't know how that works, but again, it is worth remembering that this film was written by the guy who made this movie. Anyway, soon Ed, being the personality selected to track down the killer, deduces that the escaped convict impersonating the correctional officer is the obvious killer, and both of them die in an ensuing firefight, leaving Paris Nevada as the sole survivor to represent the innocent personality of Malcolm Rivers. Oh, but we're not done yet. 
If you pay attention to the various statements made by Dr. Malik, it actually indicates that Rivers' disorder is the result of a traumatised childhood in the hands of his abusive prostitute mother. So, Paris, being a prostitute herself looking to escape her former life, is confronted by the innocent child who was assumed to have died in a car explosion earlier in the film. Yep, that's right folks, this little bastard is revealed to be the one who orchestrated all the murders this entire time, and after killing Paris, he becomes the sole personality of Malcolm Rivers, who then proceeds to kill both the psychiatrist and the correctional officer in the middle of the Nevada desert, and his reign of terror begins again. Almost as if the motel events were foreshadowing what is to come. To the film's credit, you could say the high-concept pseudo-psychological BS has some sense of bogus artistic merit to it. We always talk about these stories that get inside the head of the killer, well, here's one that's so shamelessly literal about it. Although I guess I kinda see what it's trying to do on a very thin surface level, as the psychiatrist explains, in trauma a child's mind fractures, and so to piece together the humanity within Malcolm Rivers, he has to isolate the evilness that's literally destroying him. It's interesting how we assume Paris to be the humble innocent side lulled into a false security only to be killed by the very personality that was so unsuspecting and insidious in nature. People rarely suspect a child to be capable of festering such grisly violence, yet again, like the weirdness of real life, it very much happens more than many care to realise. Paris represented Malcolm's mother, the very person he despised, so his plan this entire time was to not rid himself of his evilness, but to dispose of the fragments that reminded him of his trauma. When it comes down to it, I would argue the real underlying tragedy of it all is that Ed was really the innocent side that Malcolm was meant to become, but in the psychiatrist's attempt to get him to destroy his personalities, he places such immense strain on the one key personality that it becomes just another casualty in the process. Look, I get there's no getting past the story's ludicrousy, but to assume identity is any less poignant or profound in mild doses misses at least the idea of it. It's not perfect, it's unquestionably flawed, yet if you openly engage with its theme, it goes back to that feeling best described by Marin's poem Antigonish. Identity is about feeling disembodied and detached from your very self. That it's not simply that something is wrong with the world around us, but at times, something just doesn't feel right within us.